Hello everyone, I'm High Treason. I've got to keep it down because it's early hours of the morning, but you can see this weather's crap. But today we're going to have a look at a, a 386 system. Well, it's actually a 486 DLC that it's running mostly. We're going to swap it out and it can run another processor, which, yeah, otherwise it's not that interesting, I don't think. Not compared to the CNT we looked at a while ago, but. I think it's worth documenting. Hopefully next time we can move on to things like my Pentium 2, because that should be ready. Uh, K6 nearly done. And odds and sods, I should have got that to a point where it's practical to make, and it's things people have asked me to do, so hopefully we can get on to them. On the other hand, this bloody weather, man. You know, there's just something I think we've got to take care of really quick, haven't we? Let's be honest. believe everything you see on the internet. I was going to throw this out, it's gone off. I figured it was worth a, a quick one-off gag. Now before we go anywhere with this I'd like to apologise if the sound quality of my voice isn't quite as good as it usually is. The microphone's just, it's a bit battered. I need another one. I can fix this one but whatever. We'll, we'll deal with it. I'm doing what I can. It should be okay for now. Anyway, immediately you'll notice this thing uses the same type of case as my K5. It's not the same case. The K5 is fine, and we'll see it again someday for Cyrix reasons, shall we say. The case is just the same model. This saves me a job talking about that very much though, so yeah, let's move on. Around the back, there aren't too many things of note. VGA, a sound card you might recognise, this thing, Ethernet, things like that. You can also see where I cheated with the host adapter to save a slot, but the board doesn't line up very well with the case. On the slots or this thing, it's the same for the slots. The holes happen to be cut out here, so it's very obvious. There's really nothing remarkable back here aside from those four big jacks, but I'll tell you in advance, we won't be able to play with that today. It's not working. Cracking open the lid, I think your attention will probably be drawn to the big red card over there. Gravis Ultrasound, the original. Mine has one megabyte of RAM installed and is otherwise the same as any other GUS with that cheap looking red board and huge GF1 chip. It does look quite neat to be honest but honestly as yet I can't figure out why anyone would want the models which allow more memory anyway as I've rarely seen anything want the whole one meg on this one. Let alone more but to each his own I guess. If you've got a use for it, maybe. Is there a use for it? Uh, I, I really don't know. The VGA card is a Cirrus Logic GD5428, which is pretty much as fast as an S3 Trio 64, and as such, it's not very far off of a Seng ET4000. Pretty good cards, to be honest, and they usually cost a bit less for now. It's probably going to change at some point, as these things do. This is where things get weird, because you can clearly see it's a VLB card as opposed to ISA, which is what you'd probably expect to find in a system like this. It has two megs of RAM installed using these odd chip-on-blob things that I've only ever run into on a Trident card before. Yeah, there's a chip-on-blob on a PCB underneath that plastic cover. I'm not sure if I can show you that today. Network card is an Intel model. These are fine and they work as well as they need to once you've set them up, though I find it to be much more stubborn than the more common 3COM cards are. It requires just a little bit more work. Also, it appears the ThinNet transceiver on this one is not working. It's not really a problem today because we're using twisted power anyway, but it does remove this card from the possibility of appearing in a future project, uh, which might happen around the same time as the K5 reappears. My host adapter is ISA, mostly because the Visa Local Bus 1 I had didn't work right in here and I wanted an extra slot for that big green card over there anyway. ISA it should be fast enough for a machine like this one. I haven't had any logging for anything faster as of yet, so yeah, I don't really have any incentive to replace this. So, that big card. Basically, it's a sampler on a card. The sample cell 2, that is. The problem with this card is that it needs RAM, lots of it. It'll only take 4 meg modules and I don't have any spare ones, so it's going to have to wait until I can be bothered. 
but for today we can just ignore this thing because you can't use it without it and you need at least four four meg modules even though the manual says this thing will run with like four megs of ram installed or oh, i can't remember maybe i'm wrong it, it's not very clear it's all to save you money apparently yeah like hell it is of course they'll sell you ram right out the back of the thing most likely if i bother to read that far it's a good looking card though might end up in another system eventually, as it doesn't really fit into the role of this one very well. Sadly, the hard drive is a flash card in this case. I don't have any real ones left small enough for this, and don't really care for this machine, because I don't think it's going to live that long anyway. The, the motherboard's not very well. Installed in that motherboard is 16 megabytes of RAM, which, hell, that would work in that sampler, but it'd mean crippling the system. Uh, it's probably more than this thing needs, though. Moving on, we have the CPU. It's a Cyrix 486DLC40. It, the one under that heatsink, it's made by TI instead, just like the one I'm showing you here. But it's exactly the same regardless. There's no way I'm prying that heatsink off. I don't want to destroy my little glue on the corners. It's only on the corners, the rest of it's paste, so we can get it off if we have to. By now, I'm sure we all know that this CPU was basically a Cyrix 486 with one kibabyte of level 1 cache, which fit into a 386 socket. They were an upgrade for OEMs really, and now I guess we know one of the OEMs that used them, Acer. This motherboard's an Aopen VI9. It's made by Acer, so probably from one of their systems. I don't know its history, and there don't seem to be many of them out there. Uh, quite difficult to find anything on them really. Still, with this 386 socket, it means that we have got a 386 with VLB slots, in theory. Something you don't really see too often, and in my mind, something which was just asking for trouble. It's probably good reasons you don't really see them around. From what few boards there were, like this one, the results do seem to be mixed, and reliability wasn't always very good on some of them. Not the same model as this. I can't really find mentions of this thing but the same applies to performance it's a mixed bag from one model of board to the next and i can tell you mine is really awkward about a few things in all fairness though mine's broken it's sat in a bag with a leaking battery for a very long time before i got my hands on it no amount of cleaning is going to bring back the rotten traces inside the board and whatever other damage it's done i've no idea how long it's going to last as such the locks on the keyboard act strangely with a huge delay and the leads don't update sometimes memory managers fail because so far as i know the keyboard controller's been used to change the cpu mode back and forth as well as play with the turbo so yeah in these old machines your keyboard controller actually has some priority over the cpu in this regard Regardless, every time we start the system, this error message is going to appear, and there's not really anything I can do other than tell the system to skip error messages. It kind of reminds me of running a car with a really bad oil leak you can't fix and don't really want to because it's a wreck anyway. You know full well it's going to seize up eventually, but you're just making the most of it while you can. This board is pretty ugly anyway. Look at those bodge parts soldered on around the place. It's not pretty. Hiding under the CD-ROM drive is another socket. This takes 486 CPUs, but not at the same time as the 386 socket. You can only install one, so yeah, no sneaky, asymmetric multiprocessing here, or whatever you would call it. This socket can be used to install an FPU if the 386 socket is in use, though. Hence, it has those extra pins on the inside. Something very important here is notice pin 1 on this corner here. Well, that's not pin 1 for a floating point unit. If you're installing one of those, you have to face it towards this corner instead. Some boards mark this on the socket, mine doesn't. Always be sure how yours works if you want to install a floating point unit in something like this, because it's entirely possible that they're not all the same, and this same rule might not apply to your board. I'd also like to say a big fuck you to whoever came up with the pinout for the 387 because the power pins are almost the same from every orientation, which makes it very difficult to figure this out without having the markings. You can sit there and try and test things with a multimeter all day, but I think it's one of those where you're going to need some kind of analyzer to really figure it out for sure, unless you're really on the ball with it. Uh, had to look back at where traces were going and all sorts to figure this one out just not fun.
Another oddity with this board is right next to that socket, and it's not really obvious at first, but the clock generator actually has two 40 MHz settings. Nothing changes, they're both exactly the same, I just find it odd that there's two settings for the same thing. Uh, yeah, who knows? Really strange board anyway, so I guess nothing surprises me anymore. 128 kibabytes of level 2 cache are installed. It's easily enough for 16 megabytes of RAM in right through mode. In some boards it might even work out faster than needlessly upgrading it. Sometimes it does. There isn't really anything else to do in here right now, so to demonstrate, it's quite fast for a 4860LC thanks to those Visa Local bus slots. It plays Doom quite well and would probably be fine if we shrank the screen a little. In fact, it feels more like a low-end 486 overall. It's probably faster than that 25MHz SX we looked at. I suppose that's something we really should test. Did the 386 have a bit more mileage left in it? Could it have stayed competitive if it had Visa Local bus on more boards? This wouldn't have been practical in all likelihood because it would have cost more to implement versus on a regular 486 board, if only for the additional socket, but you're surely going to need some extra logic to do this. Still, you do have to wonder how well it holds up to a 486 in the same motherboard and whether the 486 DLC really could keep up with a 486SX. So, let's try it out. I mean, we can, so I guess we should. We have four configurations here, the Cyrix DLC 40 at 40 MHz and the Gain at 33 MHz, just to be fair. Then we have a 3860X, also running at 33 MHz, and a 486SX, again at 33 MHz. So, nice level playing field, same clock speed. The settings were identical for each test, and no hardware other than the CPU was changed. I wanted to test with FPUs, but my board won't power up with them installed, so either something is broken, or it doesn't like my IIT487 chip. Incidentally, I wanted to test the Chips and Technologies CPU in this board originally, and it just doesn't power up with that installed either. Hence, that having its own motherboard now. Yeah, that sucked, having to find that. So, yeah, this thing's just really awkward about that kind of thing. Possibly another factor in why these boards were never really very common, because I don't think this one's unique in that respect. We'll start with NSSI then. It's quite predictable here. The 4633 leads with 18,229 points, which the DLC will come in a close second at 16,800. The DLC 33 is holding up a good fight, quite good really, at 14,906. And the 3860X33 is losing out horribly with 10,128 points. Which isn't half bad, I guess. Clock for clock, the DLC actually pulls an almost 50% increase in this test over the 386, and the real 486 pushes a colossal 80% boost. The FPU test changes the game, however, as amazingly the DLC 40 manages to pull ahead with 3,235 points just beating out the 486SX with 3,218. I'm genuinely impressed, though I guess it's within the margins forever. It does seem the DLC is just a half faster. At 33 MHz, the DLC can still manage 3,199. Might as well say 3,200, which is only 19 points behind the 486SX. None of these CPUs have a floating point unit at their disposal, but you'll notice they beat an actual 387 in NSSI's database, which is really quite impressive when you think about it. This is all internal emulation. Naturally, the 3860X loses this test, grabbing a measly 635 points, making the 4860LC and 486SX of a 400% faster than a 386 at floating point emulation in this test. They can't speak for their accuracy in this field or how well they do elsewhere. The test doesn't account for that kind of thing at all. And let's be honest, NSSI is a fairly artificial environment. It doesn't really represent the real world all that much, but it tries to, in, uh, as does every benchmark. It's hit and miss. It really depends on what you're trying to do with the system as to where you'll notice performance holes or performance boosts. This is why we run multiple tests like Superscape here. The DLC 40 pulls ahead again, but only just is 25.6 points 
versus 25.4 for the 486SX. They're about even here then, as again, this really is within the margin forever, and there's really nothing much in it. The DLC at 33 megahertz, of course, does lose points, and it actually does so quite quickly with only 21.6 points, but it's still beating the plain 3860X, which can only manage 15.1 and actually crashes, which might just be my board being dodgy. PC player scored well. Yeah, my Cirrus can't do that apparently. That's a bit crap because every other 5428 I had has always managed, but not this one. We might be able to update the bias. Uh, we'll just skip it for today. I don't think it's going to really have any major bearing on what's going on here. Top Bench has the DLC 40 on top again with 144 points. This is within the DX266 ranges according to the database, but I'd wager on those being ISI only systems. VLB makes quite a difference in Top Bench in many cases. Next is the 486SX with 138 points, followed by the DLC 33 with 123, and there's really not much in it now. Even the 386 is managing to hold up about 100 points, which whilst very respectable is as we would expect, showing that it still hasn't won one of these tests yet. But fair enough, it probably shouldn't. Speed Sys is a mouthful of stuff as always, so let's just get into it. For the CPU test, the leader is the DLC40, without a doubt, 20.56 points. In second place, it's the DLC33, with 17.49, which is actually quite surprising. It seems Speed Sys tests the floating point capabilities to some degree too in this, which will affect the score here, so perhaps the combined makes it win over the 486SX, as we established in NSSI that the DLC's FPU emulation doesn't drop performance too quickly when clocking down, and we'll find out that there may be another factor shortly in Speedsys itself. But the gap is quite large, because the 486SX can only scrape a measly 12.16 in this test which is a pretty sizable gap. It's quite abysmal, really. The 386DX manages 7.58 points here, which mm, isn't really abysmal because it's a substantially older chip. Memory bandwidth is also in favour of the DLC, 22.36 megabytes per second at 40 megahertz, and 21.43 megabytes per second at 33 megahertz. We'd expect it to change a bit because the bus speed of the system is changing. Amazingly, the 386 comes in third here, but just barely with 20.63, where the 486SX manages 20.33. Could be specific to this board, but still. The 386 didn't come in last in a test, and that's going to be worth something, but you probably wouldn't notice in most tasks because the difference is so small, so it's likely not worth it. Video memory takes a slight hit at 33MHz, regardless of which chip is installed, and the differences are so small and within the margins forever, I'm not really going to go into it, but it seems to average at around 7650k per second, at 33 megahertz versus about 7000 k per second at 40. L1 cache is not tested on the 486 DLC and so Speedsys assumes the level 2 cache is taking this role. The 386 has no level 1 cache so arguably the terminology is correct here as the external cache is the only level of cache that there is and well therefore it might as well be level 1. The 486's internal level 1 cache scores 34.69 in this test, running completely unopposed. I'm going to switch the footage over to Doom a bit early here whilst we're still talking about Speedsys because it's going to take a while for the demo in that to run on here and, well, Speedsys is a static screen really, so we've seen that on there long enough. Anyway, the external cache. We can compare it if we ignore the Speedsys naming convention. It just doesn't really, yeah, we'll just disregard what it actually says there, because we know that this is the external cache by the size measurement. Now, the DLC40 leads the way with 27.49 megabytes per second, followed closely by the 3860X at 26 megabytes per second. A very impressive showing, let's be honest. 
The DLC 33 is next with 25.92, which isn't far off of the 386, but still not quite as quick for some reason at the same clock speed. The 486SX comes last at 23.20. Either way, I've got to admit, these measurements mm, don't really look all that impressive, but, well, still, the 386 didn't come last in the test. Cool. The DLC leads the way for memory throughput too, scoring 15.95 megabytes per second at both 33 and 40 megahertz. So that seems to be the limit here. The 486SX is next at 15.64 megabytes per second, and the 386 holds its own at 14.06. Overall, it's much closer than you'd have thought though. Last test here then, Doom. The 486SX takes this one in... 5,507 real ticks, or about 13.5 frames per second, which you know, seems about right. The DLC 40 comes second in 6,332 ticks, which is around 11.8 frames per second, and unsurprisingly the DLC 33 is third, managing to complete the demo in 7,471 ticks, about 10 frames a second. The 386 really doesn't stand a chance here, and it takes 11,461 ticks to finish the demo. Roughly 6.5 frames per second, which isn't too bad, though it's only a fraction faster than that Chips and Technologies machine. It will actually play just about with the screen shrank, but I've left it maxed, as always here, so it can be compared to other results from other machines. It's interesting to note that it actually will handle better than the CNT if the screen is shrank, but... Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm i not really sure how that is. Evidently, the CPU is bottlenecking it, the video subsystem and such should be able to handle it in this machine. When you look at the results together, it's a surprisingly mixed bag, though overall, the 486-class CPUs trample the 386, and so they should, given that they replaced it. There would be something very wrong if they weren't as fast. So would the 386 have a few more miles left in it if it was given VLB more broadly? Well, no, because it would cost more to implement on the 386 system, and the gains aren't really very good. In fact, with a 386 installed, this thing barely breaks ahead of the ISA-only chips and technologies machines in most tests. In fact, it even loses in some of them, likely due to the sheer complexity of getting this board to work. It's not too shabby with the 486 DLC installed, however, and you would have been able to upgrade to a real 486 DX2 later on if you bought a machine like this. But it seems that didn't happen to this one, and in fact, any of the other ones I've seen around, so I'm not sure what the target market for this type of board was, or whether it played out as intended. They were clearly a niche thing and didn't become very commonplace. At the time, I'd say they weren't the best idea if you were buying the board to build a system, because you might as well have bought a real 486 board. The single clock 486 was already dropping in price because the DX2 was out, and in fact, the DX4 was already on its way, and I believe we would have already known about it. And the DX4 is a CPU that won't work in this board without a costly adapter, because it only provides 5 volts to the CPU sockets. So the only way it might have worked out is if you were building a system and earned a 386 chip already that you planned to upgrade later. But even then, what did this board cost? Were you really saving that much? Would it be worth it over just waiting until you could afford a real 486? Today, from the standpoint of a collector, is it worth having? Well, perhaps it is. It's unusual and it has some strange behaviours, like not powering on when it encounters a chip it doesn't like, or throwing a fit about the card order. I wouldn't usually install the cards like this, but this board has a couple of problems whereby there are things physically in the way of some slots, and, well, quite a good number of them, and sometimes cards don't work in certain slots. This throws card ordering in the trash, which is something of a lost art form. See the back of this system. Notice how there's a gap between each card, aside from the two audio cards at the bottom. That's to stop noise getting into things. It keeps the VGA signal clean, and it keeps buzzing out of the audio. It probably doesn't make that much difference, really, especially with how noisy old sound cards are, and 
how the deck on even older VGA cards or cheap ones just wasn't always that good anyway, but sometimes it does make a difference. Sometimes things will even act really weird and not work properly if they're too close to one another. It's very rare, but it does happen. There are cases of this being an issue where simply moving the order of the cards has been good enough to make things behave themselves, or to make them less noisy or work in a different... It depends what your issue is. It's just something to bear in mind, though, if you, you run into something odd like that on a, an old machine, or even a new one. This does still apply, but without parallel buses being so commonplace now, it's it's not so much of an issue. Remember, all the ISA slots are just pin-to-pin -pin tied together, so if one card's making a noise, it's going to get into every other card on the system pretty easily. The, the capacitors will suppress it more the farther away from the slot it gets, but... Yeah, uh, nowadays they don't work like that. They're, they're serial type buses, PCI Express as far as I know. Now the thing you're going to notice very quickly is the lack of game footage. And, well, that's mostly down to the Gravis ultrasound. It's not a case of the machine can't run them. I've got the CNT machine, it's actually right here at the moment, which, you know, does fine on a mono sound blaster is enough. Uh, the Gravis is a bit of a hindrance because not many games really work with it, and a lot of the ones that do, I don't really think are that good, or I don't enjoy them. An example would be Jazz Jackrabbit, where it's not necessarily a bad game, but I find the controls really awkward, and I don't enjoy playing it. It might be controversial. In fact, this whole thing might be. I'm sure I'll go on a rant about the Gravis somewhere, but... Really, the games that do use it properly, uh, didn't really use it properly. You know, there's a, the support for it was pretty terrible a lot of the time, like the driver for it in Terminal Velocity, or, or Duke Nukem 3D, or even, I'm sure Doom supports it. I, I know it's one of the FPS games, the, the big ones, that does. Uh, I know Duke 3D does. A podgy sound system's pretty poor in general, regardless of what cards you run it on, so that's not really far. But for those games, obviously, we, we need a faster machine to really get the most of them. And the problem is the gust drivers aren't that reliable, um, they will always have a problem, and as the machine gets faster that seems to get worse, and especially as you're going to start running Windows 95. And the card has some missing features in Windows 95, you just sort of things you'd expect on any decent sound card, it seems to lack in mixing and such, and the drive's installed very awkwardly, it's not something I enjoy running it under. And so it sort of cuts its own foot off doing that. It makes this machine a bit impractical for that kind of thing. Uh, Sound Blaster emulation is terrible a lot of the time as well. I mean, if I can show you some examples, here you go. It's not very good a lot of the time. It's a mixed bag. Some of it actually sounds quite decent, but most of the time the Adlib music's just emulating it with just random MIDI samples, like samples the, the MIDI synth uses. It's not really great. And Sonic did it later. And Sonic's implementation was worse. And I'm not saying the Gus is a bad piece of hardware. Obviously, we watch demos on it, but again, you know, things like second reality. They're good, but the demos that I think were the best are things like Xeos and Euthanasia's Spirit, which, fantastic demos, but we need a faster machine. And the gust just ends up crippling the machine instead in that case, whereas the machine's sort of crippling what the gust can do here, and 
well the gust is limiting what we can play on it. It's a bit of a problem and a lot of people I speak to, I, like I say, I know I'm going to have a rant about the card later, uh, they, they'll complain about, you know, I, the, the prices, and rightly so, they say they really want a gust. Well I'll tell you something, you are not missing out. Like, a lot of the games that did support, well, like I said, Jazz Jackrabbit, I don't think are that good. And the card itself is just not practical. I'm not saying it's a bad piece of hardware, but it's not practical at all. It's, it's a good piece of kit in principle, Paul. The, the design of it is pretty fantastic. It's very ahead of the curve, in a way. It was... A, a, you know, they were trying to do something new, man. They, they were trying to, to make something. Nobody had really tried that much before. And I really, really do like things that do that. It's a good piece of hardware, but it's not a practical piece of hardware. You can't really get much use out of it. Uh, Multi-card setups, if you can get them to work, maybe, but they often don't. I've never been successful with it, with the Gravis. It eats so many resources. And interrupts and such are very, very valuable. They're hard to manage under DOS. Uh, my Pentium 2 actually has two cards in and that's a very lucky case and it's still difficult to manage and that's in Windows when we can IRQ share so you know we can actually get away with it a bit it's still really pushing it so I wouldn't recommend that and for the price they are today no they're overrated they're overpriced don't pay it So there we go, that's this thing, the VI9 as I call it, it's not not as interesting as the chips and technologies machine, it's not very useful, and I'll be honest, it probably will break, I don't know how long it'll be around, it, it kicked and screamed about being brought back from the dead, and I'm not going to make it keep going when it, it breaks, it's not a very useful machine, I'm getting no real use out of it, but it's, it's told us you know, it's given us what we wanted to know. It's done its job. I always wondered how these would work out, and well, it was interesting. You know, it's it's answered questions I've had for years about these. So yeah, performance does vary a lot apparently with these boards. So you know, on reliability, you, you get a VLB three eight six board or a four eight six board with a three eight six socket. Which you don't see those too often either, which whichever way you look at it, you know might not work very well, that's a real likelihood, in all honesty, there'll be something up, it's the, even this one's very stubborn about what you can put in it, you know, it won't start with certain processors, and doesn't like co-processors, uh, I don't know, yeah, and actually this board, there was an option to have a Cyrix uh, 87 just soldered on the board, shame we didn't have that really, but the OEM or the original builder, whoever, didn't pay for that option, I guess. I've not seen one with it. I don't know if they ever actually installed them, but it seems like it was at least thought of. So, there's that. Now, yeah, uh, next up. I need something more interesting than this. My Pentium 2 should be done. We're missing a couple of minor peripherals, but if I don't have those, well, we can do it anyway. They're so insignificant that we can just mention them in passing. I mean, pretty much analog capture card, which I'm not really going to use now because, you know, I don't really need it. But I want to put one in there. It's what I had planned, so it's what we'll do. Uh, I probably have one somewhere, to be honest. Wouldn't surprise me. I'll have a look around. I think I've still got that win off. It's not very good, but it's good enough for this. Uh, what else? K6. That's, that's coming along. Maybe we can see that. K6 actually works. Uh, I like Pentium 2s and K6s, I always wanted to mess with those. Uh, odds and sods, because the P2 is in its own video now, because it's working, it wasn't before, and because we did a couple of other things, you know, elsewhere, we, we managed to shift things around. It should be practical now to do that, with any luck, I don't know when, I don't know what order these things are going to be in, however they turn out. I got some up planned for April, I've uh, 
got some a plan, maybe May, I don't know, uh, but I've got something planned at some point. It's a pretty big undertaking in reality, uh, probably for a rather short video, but we'll see how it turns out. There's uh, things people have asked me to do, uh, which I, I'd like to do. D DCA motherboards, I've had a couple of people ask me about those over the years. If I find one cheap with the RAM, then yeah, I'll try one out, but I have not seen one cheap ever, and much less with the RAM. But if I see one, I guess I'll play with it. I'm kind of curious about those. Uh, Coax Ethernet, people have asked about that a couple of times. I've been waiting for excuses, and I'm like, you know what, sod it. Let's just do this. You know, we might as well. I've kind of wanted to mess with it for a few years now. As I didn't move off it until 2007, I was still using that, but, you know, only a little bit, but, yeah, it's, uh, so sort of messed with that a bit somewhere. Uh, maybe set up a land manager or Lantastic or something. Uh, Cyrix Process, a couple of people have asked me, apparently I don't use those enough, and I agree, I like Cyrix Processors, so I have some, I guess we'll have to mess with those somewhere. I'm not sure how I'm going to fit these together yet, but... We'll, uh, we'll look into it because, yeah, I, I think we do need to test some Cyrix stuff out properly. It's not something we've really done enough of around here. Uh, should be able to do that. Especially one day how my K5 will perform if we put a Cyrix 6x86 in there. I don't think it'll beat the K5 from what we've seen before, but well, we can give it a go, I suppose. I don't really know what else we've got. Uh, there, there must be something. My Pentium Pro is is here, but it doesn't work that well. It probably would now. I've got a ground cable. That's how I got my Pentium 2 going. But I don't think it's really worth looking in now. It's, I don't find Pentium Pros very interesting. I, I think they're boring. The, the problem I have with those is if you're running like DOS stuff, it just feels like, oh god, you know, Pentium would do this better. Or if it's more demanding, uh, uh, Pentium 2 would do this better. My Pentium 2 is for like uh, mostly composing and such, but you know, I, I use my old Pentium 2 for music. That's what I want to use this for. I'm using this P4 that somebody tr trashed. It's terrible, but better than the T3200. But it has timing problems because it's on XP, so you're on HAL and this kind of unstable latency, which you get in longer tracks, knocks them out of sync. Because you can only do one channel at a time with uh, these old synthesizers. The, the Casio can actually do eight channels, but you can only play one note on each of them, so you better just have one polyphonic channel and layer them together in uh, whatever you're using to mix them. Vegas, in my case, which is not the best thing, but it works. You know, I'm not that good anyway, there's no point in, you know, I'm just messing around, I'm having fun with this. Uh, yeah, uh, so I want to use that for composing, but That'll play Windows games better than the, the Pentium Pro anyway, uh, so that's the thing, I just I don't think Pentium Pros are that interesting. They're a bit like the Gravis, they're expensive, a lot of people want them, and I really can't see why. Having used one, it just doesn't get that much use. It just doesn't do anything interesting, it, it doesn't do anything as well as the systems that surround it. My K5 is almost invariably going to do the things that it's doing better. My Pentium 2 is invariably going to do the things that it does better. The Pentium Pro is just kind of in this no man's land where it's it's not really that good at either one of them. You're always going to find it's too quick, too slow, lacks a feature, just isn't quite really there. And yeah, it's sort of just considered an early Pentium 2, a, a proto Pentium 2 that's not quite as good. Effectively, I guess it is architecturally at least. Uh, no AGP on them and no SD RAM on most of the boards. If you find one of those, you're going to set your back. And by then you might as well have just got a Pentium 2 because they're nowhere near as expensive and under a lot better in my opinion. Some of them you can even underclock pretty well. Uh, it really does vary. You look at to find a Pentium 2 motherboard that you can clock down, but if you do find one, well, you're going to be able to just sit in the Pentium Pro performance band if you want. You've even got SMP on slot one, man. It's a much better platform. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. But you might think differently. I don't know. You might be running something else. You might... Maybe it's really good for Unix stuff, but... Like, maybe Linux, or... Maybe it runs OS too good. 
tempted to put OS2 on mine, but I don't know, and it's not something I have that much interest in. I want to mess with OS2, but anyway, I'm rambling, and I don't have much left to ramble about today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of here. Um, like I say, apologies, this one's not the most interesting, but I figured we should do it, and yeah, you know, I've got a few things I need to shift, a couple of hardware things I need to alter for video making, but... don't know what that was. It was like something grabbed by Kurt. Well, ghosts aside, I'm high treason. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later. And those things I was all about, they're very minor, you won't notice a difference, they won't impact anything at all. But I'm out of here until next time. I'll see you around.